In today's video, we're gonna check out some creepy TikTok conspiracies. Let's get into it. I'm gonna be completely honest. I'm not feeling very well today. I even called out of work because I just do not feel good. And during the recording process of this video, I just, I had, I was stumbling on words and it was just not really good content, I don't think. So I'm gonna remove all of my reaction out of this video and it's gonna be just the clips. So I hope you guys don't mind and I should be back up and running tomorrow. There's something strange in the water right now outside of South Africa. People are saying that this surfaced and it came from the direction of Antarctica and now it is larger than the size of Texas. Why isn't everyone talking about this? Take a look at this. So this is the size of this thing. Nobody knows what it is. It's an anomaly, can't be explained, and there's a projection that shows it moving over the last few days. It popped up, it disappeared, and then it reappeared, and now it's right off the uh, off of the Africa, and it's larger than the state of Texas, to put this in perspective for you. Some people are saying that it's many different things, but this is so strange. So they were using an Earth satellite map, and they measured the size of this anomaly and said the area um, the, in the ocean, it's more than 2,000 miles long and 15, 1,510 miles wide. This is insane. What is that in the ocean? And it's also traveling toward America. So over the next few days, it's going to gradually go and grow in size. So what is this? Someone said who released the Kraken. But seriously, what is going on? This happened right after the eclipse. And what is in the water? Can someone please explain? Comment below. Did you know one of the most mysterious ancient sites in all of Egypt is not open to the public? I'm going to try and give you a little rundown about what the Assyrian is, what we know so far, because it's a real head scratcher. Nobody knows who built it, when, or why. Like, what actually is it? So, let's get into it. Way down the bottom of the River Nile, there is a place called Abydos in Egypt, which is one of the most ancient places in Egypt, we can find first and second dynasty graves there. So, people were here literally... 5,000 plus years ago, maybe even more, and it, it's just a super old place, right? In Abydos, there is a temple called the Temple of Osiris, or uh, Seti the First Temple Complex, which actually isn't that old. Um, the temple there is dated to around the Middle Kingdom. We know who built it, we know why, no mystery there. What is mysterious, though, is that around the back, below the ground level of the Temple of Osiris, we find a thing called the Osirian meters below the ground level of the surface of the temple above. Are you with me? This is looking down from ground level. This is how deep into the ground the Osirian goes. There is a mysterious temple complex deep into the earth. And don't let the photo before uh, confuse you about how big this site is. It is huge. We are talking huge megalithic pillars built deep into the earth. Each of these are cut from one block of granite and they are estimated to be weighed around 70 tons each. And originally there was pillars and as you can see the blocks on the top, they would have gone over to create like a roof. This is just the top of what would be a five story complex going into the ground. Just for size reference, this is me. I'm nearly six foot tall in these platforms. Look how tiny I look next to these huge, massive granite pillars. Also note that there is not a scratch of decoration in the entire complex. It is all minimal. It is all megalithic. It kind of doesn't look Egyptian. You know what I mean? Now, it's not just the impressive stonework that makes the Assyrian incredibly interesting. Notice the nubs above here, but it's the water. So around the central island of the temple complex is water, there's a moat. And guess how deep this moat is? Guess how deep, if you fell into that, guess how deep that went down? 15 meters, this goes down. They did seismic scans of the area and found that it goes down at least 15 meters. Not only that, the central island is hollow. So that shows that it could maybe have chambers. Can't say for certain because no one's been inside because it's full of water. But what's going on here? 
Here's a diagram to show what I mean. I was that little person standing up there next to the huge megalithic pillars. I was standing on top of a huge 15 meter granite island, potentially with a chamber inside. There is 15 meter pure drop of moat. And then the side walls is 15 meters of walls going right into the ground, equivalent to a five story building. Now, this is where it starts to get really insane. The scientists were like, well, where does it stop? Where's the foundation that the building complex was built on? Turns out doesn't have one. It is literally plugged in and resting on 900 metres of water impregnated sand. And so the, before you get to anything remotely solid, it's 900 metres now, we only rediscovered the Osirian in the late 1800s, and they only started to really try and excavate it around the 1920s. And one of the first things they tried to do was get rid of the water so they could see how deep it went and check it all out. Only they couldn't because the water in the Osirian is completely unpumpable. They have been trying to pump out the water since the 1920s, and even with modern equipment that could pump out like 500 gallons a minute, they cannot get the water out of this site it just keeps refilling because it is sitting on 900 meters of water impregnated sand which is coming up from a natural aquifer not the nile so when they tested the water in the osirian they found out that it categorically is not coming from the river nile or any other local canal or river it is a very specific type of aquifer water on this site which is probably why the ancient people knew this for a reason they built this whole complex for a reason because of the water but if you cannot pump the water out it brings into question how the hell did they build the temple please if anyone has a good theory about this because it keeps me up at night but literally you can't use any of the modern methods of sandbagging or pumping out the water because you cannot redirect the aquifer it keeps just refilling up so how did they get to build the wall 15 meters down and the chamber and line up the precision like how did they do it but also why what is this what is this whole site for is it does does the water do magic well i mean that sounds ridiculous but one of the dudes who um has been excavating and, and researching this site like since the 80s he decided once they tested the water and found out that it was um, not Nile water, it wasn't wastewater, it wasn't coming from anywhere else but deep within the earth, and it was safe to drink. Bit dirty, but safe to drink. So he decided he was going to do his own experiment for his own entertainment, and he was going to drink as much of the Assyrian water as he possibly could. And he said he drank gallons of the stuff. Obviously, he filtered it first, but anyway. And again, this guy is a legit scientist, and he claims openly on his YouTube channel, that after he drank gallons and gallons of this water, he didn't notice anything apart from when he went to have his eyes retested for his driving license because he's always worn glasses and always had bad eyesight. He now has 20-20 vision and he can't say it's because of the water, but he can't think of anything else that changed leading up to the change in his eyesight. Does the Assyrian water have healing properties or some sort of something. We don't know. Now, whether or not the Assyrian water fixes your eyesight is yet to be investigated properly. But one thing that was with quantifiable data is the thermodynamic properties of the Assyrian water. It is being heated by a source that they cannot find. They're not sure why. It is also displaying some really weird results. They did multiple tests, repeated tests, and they found that the water appears to not stick to the rules of the laws of thermodynamics. For example, you, uh, heat cannot pass through a cold body and like retain its heat, yet the Assyrian water was able to do this when flowed through various apparatus. So there is a huge question mark in working out why it is appearing to betray the laws of thermodynamics. I'm going to have to make a part two on this site because there is so much more to why th this site is bizarre and the big question of could it be ridiculously old so i'm gonna do a part two okay y'all so this right here is a sun simulator right so peep this look at the hexagonal shapes of the sun simulator 
and uh, as the eclipse was going on, I took a video, and I couldn't see the eclipse happening on the sun, but look at that glare right there. If you can look real close, what does that look like? Like a honeycomb, the hexagonal shapes shimmering. Um, that's quite odd, y'all. Very odd. So, yeah, I mean, that's pretty obvious that that is not a regular sun glare. So this guy right here um, took a video and he saw something behind the sun, right? Look at that sun glare down there at the bottom. It looks like a cross. I, um, you know, it may have nothing to do or may have nothing that to do that Jesus has done. It's probably the government. Anyway, so propaganda. So I decided to take it into the editor and look at this, you guys. Play with the, uh, you know, the uh, contrast and all that stuff. Well, I be dang, what does that look like, guys? There is, without a doubt, you guys, a sun simulator in front of our sun. Why? I don't know. They're hiding something and or has something to do with our food source. Um, they want us to get sick. They want our f crops not to grow, so we become reliant on them. Um, they're hiding celestial bodies. Maybe our sun is uh, gone out, maybe. And just another thing, have y'all ever thought, you know, in the Bible where it talks about the three days of darkness, right? What if it's not three days? Because you know in the Bible sometimes a day is a year or years a day, whatever, in, interchangeably. What if it's not literal three days of darkness, guys, and it's three years? I don't know, food for thought, just my opinion. But my opinion on the sun right here, I don't think it's a, an opinion at this point. I think that that is a sun simulator. All right, thanks, guys. Guys, scans have been done around and underneath the Hawara Pyramid in Egypt, and you need to see what they've found. Right, let me bring you up to speed. You've probably heard of the Lost Labyrinth of Egypt, which is supposedly underground and around the Hawara Pyramid in Egypt, or what's left of it. And we know that in 2008, the Matahar expedition went out and LIDAR scanned the ground all the way around the Hawara Pyramid and, and the area. And they found results consistent with reports from the 5th century BC when Herodotus went to visit the site. And he personally saw 3,000 chambers of this amazing Egyptian labyrinth. Now, the LIDAR scanning wasn't conclusive, but it was showing uh, what they thought was meter thick granite walls what they thought previously was a granite foundation for the labyrinth turns out probably the granite ceiling and it goes down way deeper but it gets better it gets better than these scans i'm talking about new stuff so in a nutshell you can now scan deep underground using space satellites i'm not entirely up to speed with how this works and also why this is not being done everywhere but look what they found. Not one, but two distinct levels of the underground labyrinth outside Hawara, and it's it's freaking phenomenal. The first level, found 18 meters below ground, has 31 chambers. Three of them are bigger than Olympic-sized swimming pools. For size reference, that means you could fit a Boeing 737 in this underground labyrinth chamber. <laughs> now there is a separate maze of chambers found at 40 meters below ground level, which has 32 chambers, three of which also are bigger than an Olympic sized swimming pool. What were they doing? Also the tunnel and like passageway system between all of these chambers is over 1.8 kilometers long. Now here's where things start to get a bit more mysterious. When measuring the alignment, the angle of where the underground labyrinth is aligned to compared to the Hawara pyramid above, they they don't match. They don't seem to like be cohesively in sync with each other. As in the pyramid and the labyrinth are 20, 25 degrees on the wonk, which implies that they weren't originally designed to be featured together and that the pyramid was possibly made 
a lot later than the original underground chambers. So when were they ma- when were they made? Now, what we do know is that these scans seem to confirm exactly what Herodotus described in the 5th century when he went visiting, because in the very end of the dynastic Egyptian times, the upper part of the, like, the first level, above ground part of the labyrinth was open to visitors because he visited and had a lovely little tour around, but they told him that he was not allowed to visit the underground, so he had to take it on on a good faith, the description of what was going on there. And he said that they are, and here we're quoting Herodotus, there are double sets of chambers, which we've seen on the scans, 3,000 altogether, 1,500 above and the same number underground. We are, well, we we haven't found 3,000, but maybe they were like built up into smaller sections back then. We don't know. Um, we ourselves have viewed that those that are above and we speak of what we have seen, but we've learned through conversation about the underground chambers. The Egyptian caretakers would by no means show them to us as they were, as they said, the burial vaults of the kings who first built this labyrinth. Interesting choice of words that Herodotus used that not the kings that built the labyrinth, the kings who first built the labyrinth. For me, that could imply that there were stages in this construction, levels. It was something that has been developed over time. And he was referring to the first builders. But there were, if there's a first, there's got to be like other ones, right? Now, sadly, every bit of the visible uh, above ground part of the labyrinth has entirely disappeared. Because after the fall of the dynastic Egyptians, the, um, the, Arab settlers came and recycled pretty much the whole site. Uh, the air, there was like a village that outside Hawara, um, which was known as like a mason's, a stone mason's village, where because people were coming and just chipping off whatever they wanted and repurposing it into uh, other buildings, other structures. So what's mad is that around the world today, there are probably structures that have parts and bits of jigsaw pieces of the lost <laughs> labyrinth of Egypt and they don't even know which absolutely breaks my heart however with the new satellite scans it shows that the chambers below ground are still very much there so we we really need to like get some spades and and sort this out because we're on a time limit because the whole area uh where Hawara is is the groundwater is slowly rising and it's slowly being flooded because in the like 70s, they built a dam which changed the whole um, underground water table. And the water table is rising in El Fayum, which is the area that it is, uh, which is great for like crops and growing stuff, but it's bad for literally drowning the lost uh, labyrinth and anything architectural that's been lost underground. So we need to act fast if we are ever going to see again in this civilization what the labyrinth look like. So petition to start digging ASAP. Thank you. I don't know why people are not talking about this, but there's going to be a star in the sky that explodes soon and it'll be so big the entire world will get a chance to see. Experts have already started moving past the solar eclipse to now predict a once in a lifetime Nova explosion in just a few weeks. Experts have even pushed up their predictions from a couple months out to now just a few weeks. So be sure to add me so I can keep you guys updated. They go on to mention that the TCRB for short explodes once every 80 years. So the last time that this has happened was back in 1946. Experts are saying that the star is roughly 3,000 light years away from Earth in the Corona Borealis. Now, the star is considered a once in a lifetime eruption because it explodes every 80 years. Most of us won't get a chance to see it again. People are making this a big deal because it is going to be visible with the naked eye, so, no expensive telescope is going to be needed to view this event. So these scientists have mentioned that the level of brightness of this star exploding will be very similar to the North Star Polaris. And again, it is important to know that no one knows exactly when this star was set to explode, but we will be looking to the Corona Borealis or the Northern Crown to watch this event occur. I'd love to keep you guys updated, so be sure to add me so I can remind you about this event the closer that we get to it. When you're a top secret clearance, when you're working for the government and they fly you into Area 51 and you're doing fucking work on spaceships, you're not allowed to tell anybody, including your wife. Yeah, so he get a phone call at like 11 p.m. I gotta go to work. And he would leave, and the wife was like, this lot of fuckers, she... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So she starts having an affair. Uh, so she starts having an affair. 
Exactly. So she starts having an affair, and she starts having an affair, and all their phones are tapped, of course. But she doesn't know their phones are tapped because she doesn't know what he's doing. Why would she? Because she, he can't tell her what he's doing. So she starts fucking this guy, and then they're worried that he's going to be in a, a situation of emo- emotional turmoil. He's going be having an effect. So they don't share the information with him. They just release him. He's now fire. So he's going back to his friends like, I'm working on fucking UFOs. They have real UFOs. They test them every Wednesday. So he takes people out to Area 51, to an area that's restricted now. But back then, before the Obama administration came along, and the Obama administration expanded the boundaries of Area 51, it was the first time they admitted Area 51 even existed. So they had expanded because too many people were getting close enough to film things. So these guys went out there and they filmed these fucking flying saucers flying around. And they've seen this... There's videos of the saucers, there's videos of these things moving around the desert. So you can find them, this grainy Area 51 footage. So they're doing these things where these vehicles are operating in a way conventional vehicles in 1989 were absolutely incapable of doing. Right? As far as our understanding, right? he gets arrested, they catch him, what are you doing? And he says, he just spills the beans. I got fired, I wanted to let people know that this is real, now his life's in danger. There's even a dish on the moon that we transmit via laser information to every single week. Who who, who are we talking to on the moon? What makes you think that they've already made communications? Well, to me, just based on the advancement in sciences and what looks and appears to be of NASA as a front, the fake space agency, in other words, doing all the things that are that are already done in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, and still utilizing that same those same techniques today, knowing that we're we know that they're 300 years ahead of us technologically, they meaning the private corporations. Well, why aren't we seeing any of that tech being used? So I just believe that, you know, and I know there's 300 years ahead from my private meetings. So I have a tech company called First Class Space Agency. Now I was privy to a TS clearance for private space meetings at the Space Symposium in Colorado a few years ago. And in this room, I'm sitting there with some of the top tech companies in the world in space, uh, you know, travel and also ancillary uh, parts for space like you know, radiation hardened computer circuits and everything else. And they're all talking about how advanced, you know, they are. And the number is 300 years ahead of the, po- the general population. So if they're 300 years of the general population, 300 years ahead, then what in the world are we doing with chemical rockets going up into space and all this kind of crazy stuff? Mm-hmm. So to me, when they say that they're communicating, I say, let me extrapolate a little bit more. They're, I mean, they're trying to communicate. Let me extrapolate. You, you are communicating. It's just my, the way, I, the way I decode it is there's something going on. They've probably made some kind of a type of contact at some point because they keep transmitting nonstop, up and down, up and down, nonstop. What do they think was used to carve these things? Is there any markings on them that would indicate? I, there is. So there's a whole realm of what I would call machining marks that exist all over these sites in Egypt. You find... Amazing evidence from massive circular source. You see machining marks. There are there are these tube drills. I I've got like an hour long documentary just on the tube drills. There is evidence for very sophisticated and powerful tools that is etched into these artifacts from the very earliest points in Egypt all over the place. Uh, the tube drills are really interesting because it's a very thin tool, and and what they would do, they range in size from like a half inch up to nine inches. And those plugs that were removed yeah, from the stone. It's just like a hollow, a hollow tool that gets, that gets cut down and then you snap off the core. Uh, it is a famous core. It's called Petrie's core number seven. And it was, it's a, it's a drill core from one of these holes. It's in granite. It's been analyzed several times. It's been an argument that's been going on for literally 150 years about this core. Those spiral gro- that groove that goes around in very obvious striations, right? Mm-hmm. So it's been incontrovertibly shown that that's a spiral. It's a, it's a spiral. So it, it's not like just horizontal striation. So if you can imagine the way we do it today without, we have two drills and core drills, spins really fast, makes lots of little marks. There's been studies done looking at those, at those sort of marks. That's not what we're seeing here. What we see here is a continuous spiral groove of at least two points. So it's, it's a twin spiral that runs down the length of the core. Now, from that and analyzing that, you can determine a few things, things like how, how fast was this drill or how, how quickly was this drill penetrating the granite? And Petrie and Dunn both analyzed it and looked at it. Well, it's about a 1 in 60 rate. So for each, say, 60 inches of horizontal travel, it's going 1 inch into the stone. So imagine that. So if you, if you take a, take a spiral and, and straighten it out, and you just imagine, alright, 60 inches this way, you're getting 1 inch of vertical travel. That, that figure is 500 times greater than we can achieve today in terms of 
how 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 fast it penetrates the granite. Five hundred five hundred tons greater. Now it 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 doesn't mean it cut quicker. It could have been moving slowly, like it might have been turning slowly. Right. But it's penetrating the granite at a rate far greater than what we can achieve with our technology today. We have the ability and the capacity to create our own reality. You can become whatever you like to become. It's up to you. So then, when you start thinking about that, then you begin to realize the importance of your thoughts. And if your thoughts create your reality, and if you want a better reality, you need to create better thoughts. Which means you got to work on negative thoughts that don't serve you, and spend more time creating good thoughts, because the good thoughts create your reality, and then you will live in that reality that you've created. But then people will say, "Well, I do that, but nothing changes in my reality." Well, talk to the ones who have done this, and it has worked for them. So if it works for just one other person, it means it can also work for you. You must be doing something wrong. Find out what it is. The creator of the universe in the Bible, that God is not the creator of the universe. Mm -hmm. But what I was saying was, I believe in the creator of the universe. Mm -hmm. But I don't believe that the one in these books, these religious books, is the actual creator of the universe. Mm -hmm. I've never read any book, scripture, cylinder scroll, papyrus of any type. And I've been to ancient sages, wisdom keepers all around the world. Mm -hmm. Nobody has ever told me anything that convinces me that they had a direct interaction or had heard or written this word from the creator of the universe itself. Hmm. It's all written by man. And so any religious book that ha that comes out, you look at the history of that writing, right? You look at the biblical text. Yeah. Again, it's men writing this information. Etching it into tablets later on, which was copied into uh, papyrus papers, which in, 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 sheet, in sheets or, or scriptures, which were then copied over into the actual canonized book. You look at uh, Muslims, right? Uh, a person, an angel appears to uh, yeah, Muhammad, and he he gives him this information, and then he he has a scribe write it down. Again, another man is writing the information mm -hmm. into into a book, but it's not even you know, it's not directly being written by quote unquote God. Right. So it's always this situation where mankind is interacting directly in writing this text themselves, mm. but it's not coming from a heavenly source. In other words. Nobody is coming down from God, from space, and then writing this stuff themselves and saying, here's the book, I'm giving it to you directly for me. It's always a man's hand right. on a piece of paper and a pen or a stylus and a Sumerian tablet. And so I believe that God does exist because the, meta, the, 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 the uh, quantum physics and the quantum mechanics proves, the science proves in an existence of a creator because we're living in a creation. Mm. We're living in a fractal holographic matrix. So that's provable. But... These books are written by men. And these men that they're talking about that they're calling gods aren't really gods. This is all the things that happened in the last month that the mainstream news won't tell you about. We now officially know what happens when we die. A recent study that was done shown that a man who had passed away, his brain was still active for around eight minutes after death and was basically using the same patterns as dreaming. Sea levels are rising extremely rapidly all around the globe and it's reported that coastal areas in the UK and even places like New York in America will be completely submerged by 2050. A new company have just unveiled their tech which is going to be able to record your dreams and play them back to you. Yeah, I'm not joking. Predictions have started coming true for 2024. This is the mystic Baba Vanga who predicted things with an alarming accuracy rate of over 85%. And she had some crazy predictions for 2024 such as an economic crisis, solar storms and loads more stuff and they're already starting to come true. Scientists are wanting to bring back the Tasmanian tiger. Great. Well, that's a good idea. Saudi Arabia's line, which is going to be this huge project of 105 miles long, is now decreasing to one kilometre. What is the flipping point? But yeah, make sure you hit that follow button. I'll keep you updated on all the stuff. All right, guys, I'm going to go ahead and end this video here. Again, I'm really sorry about not reacting to this video like I normally do. I really appreciate you sticking around and watching the video if you did this far. And tomorrow I should be back up and running again. Hopefully I'll be feeling better. With that being said, have a good day.